transformations, they're very, very simple to understand. Uh, they are completely diffusionless. There's no change in composition. The crystallography is well established and so on. But the transformations that I'm going to cover in the whole course are all of these. Okay? So you can divide them into two parts. Uh, one is the displacive transformations. That means when you have a parent crystal structure, which is austenite, and you transform it to another crystal structure, it's a deformation. There's no diffusion of atoms. Okay? Uh, and that deformation will change the parent crystal structure into the product crystal structure. So the term displacive means that you produce displacements. You are very familiar with displacements, you know, in your formability, but this is actually a crystal structure change which causes displacements. I'll show you more detail about that later. And reconstructive means you start with a parent crystal structure, you break all the bonds, and you rearrange the atoms into a different pattern. That clearly requires diffusion. Okay? And if diffusion occurs, then there may also be a composition change because some atoms will prefer to be in the parent and other atoms in the product phases. So if you look over here, this is uh, what many people call grain boundary ferrite. I'll explain the term allotromorphic uh, later. Uh, this is uh, intragranularly formed ferrite. I will explain this later, massive ferrite. And perlite you might be familiar with, which is a mixture of cementite and ferrite. And all of these transformations involve diffusion even if it is pure iron, okay? even if uh, the ferrite is forming in pure iron, there must be diffusion for these transformations to happen. I'll explain why later on. These are all transformations which alter the shape of the parent crystal. That means they have displacements. Yeah? And you can see those displacements physically. You know, if you observe the transformation happening, you can see the displacements. But clearly, they are different. This is Wiedenstein ferrite, bainite, and martensite. So what are the differences? And why do we need to study these differences? So throughout this course, I will give you examples of how to use your knowledge in order to design better steels. Okay, so there will be various case studies. And we'll finish the course with the world's first bulk nanostructured steel designed using the knowledge that I hope to teach you. Okay? So just relax, enjoy yourself, and ask questions when you don't understand. So the first topic is about martensitic transformations. And I'd like to ask you some questions. Uh, what, what is martensite? What do you understand by martensite? So tell me what you understand by martensite. So, you know, when I ask a question like this, don't worry about getting it wrong. That's the whole idea. You've all heard of martensite, right? So what does it mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, uh, good point. So let's, let's uh, just see if I can, I have some technology here for writing, but the handwriting won't be very good, okay? So the fir first point is that um, rapid cooling is necessary for martensitic transformation, okay? So, rapid, Cooling. What else? Sorry? Right. Okay, so it's uh, not equilibrium. Come on, machine. Oh, sorry, I'm writing on the wrong place. Not equilibrium.
What else? What else do you know about mountain sight? Sorry? Right. So the crystal structure of mountain sight is either body centered uh, cubic or body centered tetragonal. Let's write that down. So crystal structure, sorry about this handwriting, but there's not a lot I can do about it, okay, is BCC or BCT, body-centered cubic or body-centered tetragonal. What else? It has start and finish temperatures. Finish temperatures. So you're missing a uh, really important. Say a bit more. So you, you said there is more solubility for carbon in martensite than ferrite and less than in austenite, did it? Hmm. I'll write it down, yeah? Did you say diffusion-less? Key characteristic, yeah? Diffusion-less. Anything else? You've all looked at the structure of mountain site, haven't you? In an optical microscope or scanning microscope. Is there anything special about the shape? It's a plate or needle, as you said. What else? So, very hard. Now, do most of you have an Android telephone? Yeah? There's no iPhone users here, right? Is that right or wrong? Do you all have Android telephones? Okay. So, all except you can download an app uh, which is about Martin Sight. Just search for impurity on Google Play and you will be able to hear sound of Martin Sight forming. Now why do you get sound when Martin Sight forms? So you hear a beautiful song, you know, when Martin Sight is forming. Why do you get that? Sorry? Rapid change uh, of atoms, yeah. So the transformation is fast, okay? So fast transformation.
Okay, uh, there are many, many things we can say about Mahdin site. I'm going to show you that all of these are wrong except one. Okay? None of these are actually strictly correct. So let's proceed. So this is uh, an exercise called brainstorming, where you say what you think without worrying about whether it's right or wrong. And the idea is to stimulate your thoughts, not to worry about getting it right or wrong. Okay, the uh, first thing that uh, many people would say about martensite is that it forms at low temperatures. Okay? Uh, we didn't uh, identify that as a characteristic, but normally people would say martensite forms at low temperatures, and you can see that that is not true. Here we have zirconia, which is a ceramic, where you can get martensitic transformation at 1200 Kelvin. Of course, you can get martensite forming at a very low temperature. For example, in this uh, nickel-rich uh, alloy, uh, martensite forms at approximately 4 Kelvin. Okay. And you could use that to say that you know, it is a diffusionless transformation because there's no way you will get diffusion of iron atoms within the time scale of the experiment at 4 Kelvin. Uh, this is argon nitrogen solid solution, and you can get martensitic transformation at 30 Kelvin. This also illustrates the point that martensite isn't there only in steels. It happens in many materials. Okay? Therefore, when we say that the structure is BCC or BCT, that may not be true. For example, in copper aluminum alloys, you might get a transformation from BCC to FCC martensite, or it might be a monoclinic structure in shape memory alloys, and so on. So it depends on what kind of uh, parent phase we are talking about and what kind of material we are talking about on the crystal structure of martensite. And in this course, in the first two lectures, you, you will be able to decide whether any material can undergo martensitic transformation or not. So I will teach you the principle on why some materials have martensite, other materials do not have martensite. Now, notice also that martensite does not have to be hard. Yeah? Everybody thinks martensite is hard, right? But if I take pure iron and I cool it rapidly to get martensite, it will be soft. So where does the hardness of martensite in steel come from? Carbon. So carbon uh, causes the martensite to be extremely hard. And do you know why? Sorry? Right, right. So the uh, uh, carbon is an obstacle to dislocation movement. So here's another question. Why doesn't carbon harden austenite so much? So that isn't strictly true because both are cubic. Twenty-four, yeah. BCC has even more because, you know, the slip plane uh, is the 110 slip plane and 111 directions, but also 112 directions, 113 directions, and so on. So we call that pencil glide. So there's a really interesting reason why carbon has a much bigger effect on hardening ferrite than on hardening austenite. And we'll come back to that later on. It has more space, certainly, but that isn't the main reason uh, why carbon causes a lot of hardening. It's to do with the symmetry of the whole. So in FCC, yeah, the octahedral hole is symmetrical. So if you get a, just a hydrostatic strain, then that doesn't interact strongly with dislocations, which are about shear. 
the octahedral hole in the BCC lattice is tetragonal in shape. It's not a regular octahedron. So it causes a tetragonal strain, and that has a huge interaction with dislocations. Okay? Because dislocations are about shear, not about volume change. So the it carbon in austenite behaves like a substitutional solid, just causing a uniform expansion. We'll go into this in more detail later on. Okay, so martensite does not have to be hard. It does not have to form at a low temperature. And I emphasize that martensite can form in many materials. We saw, uh, you know, copper zinc alloys, copper aluminum alloys, argon oxygen solid solutions, and so on. This is martensite in life. Okay, so do you know what this is? Yes, you're absolutely right. It's a virus, uh, and you can imagine the virus to be uh, consisting of a head and a body here. And what, what it does is that it holds on to a bacterium. And then this cylinder here contracts and injects the bacterium with its DNA, where the DNA multiplies to produce more viruses. So viruses don't reproduce by you know, mating. They reproduce differently. So the question is, how does this cylinder here go from a long thin cylinder to a short fat cylinder to operate the hypodermic needle. Well that cylinder is actually a cylindrical crystal and it undergoes martensitic transformation to a different structure which causes the shape to change. Okay? So that's exactly like martensitic transformations in steels where you start with a parent crystal structure, you produce a different crystal structure without diffusion, therefore there is a change in shape. And in the case of the virus, that change in shape operates the hypodermic needle, which pierces the bacterium. And here are some optical micrographs of the virus in action. So this is the virus, and you can see the surface of the bacterium, and the operation of the hypodermic needle. So martensite happens in life, in real life, not just in metals. Of course, once the virus has lost its DNA, it's dead, right? What is life without DNA? So there's martensite in life and in death as well. Okay. <laughs> So that virus emphasizes the change in shape when you get martensitic transformation. So if you've got a change in the crystal structure, and crystal structure is just the way in which the atoms are arranged, if you change that pattern, there must be a change in shape if there's no diffusion, right? You know, just like if you take a square and you shear it, then you've got a different shape, and your shape change is a shear. And the virus exploits that to form uh, a hypodermic needle. This shows you a shape memory element made from nickel titanium here. And this is cold and this is hot. And it's undergoing forward and reverse transformation. So here you can see origami martensite. Okay, this is produced by Professor Suchiya in Japan. Now, when you take it back to the cold state, it changes back its shape again to a flat object. Yeah, so there's, there's no, no mechanical parts there. It's just changes in crystal arrangements that are driving that deformation. So do you know what kind of applications there are in normal life of this? Um, I don't know of an application in a car. Yeah, It would be wonderful to make a car out of this, because then if you have an accident, you just put a hair dryer, and it comes back into shape. Hmm? 
Yeah, very good. Uh, so I have some really horrible looking photographs, which I won't show you, of braces for, for teeth. So the normal braces, the dentist has to tighten after, after a certain amount of time. These will maintain a constant stress because they act like a very strong rubber band. Okay? What else? These. Oh, stents, yeah. Stents, uh, stents are cylinders you put inside the heart now, uh, in order to open up the arteries. So what you do is you basically inject a catheter from there, put, it, put the stent in position and expand it. And that is made out of shape memory martensite. Okay? So you don't actually have to operate. You, know, you do it all remotely. So you recover very quickly. Uh, how about uh, glasses? Yeah, you can buy frames which are made from shape memory elements. This isn't one, okay? So if I do that, I can recover the shape by warming it up, okay? Right, so how do we know that martensite is diffusionless? You know, you've been told that martensite is diffusionless, but say you had to prove it, how would you prove it? Uh, yeah, the f uh, low temperature, so the fact that it can form at a very low temperature Okay, it does not need to form at a low temperature, but you can form it at a low temperature. Common sense tells you that there cannot be diffusion. Okay, there, I, I need two more answers. Yes, so in this institute, you have really, really good equipment to measure the chemical composition, right? So give me examples of that equipment. What kind of equipment would you use to measure the composition? Uh, electron probe microanalysis, okay. Any high, higher resolution method? So EPMA will give you maybe a, a volume of about uh, a few cubic micrometers. You know, there's an interaction zone under the surface. That means you're analyzing uh, a few micrometers. What about a higher resolution method? Sorry? EBS, uh, EBSD gives you crystallographic information. How about the atom probe? Have you heard of the atom probe? Yeah, which exists here where you can pick one atom out at a time, measure the time of flight, and therefore determine what that atom is, and you can even see the atom. Okay? So that's the highest resolution chemical analysis ever possible, and from that you can say that martensitic transformation is truly diffusionless. There is no diffusion even on a very, very, very short range. Okay? I'll show you some images of that when we come to do more difficult transformations than martensite. But in the nanocenter here, you have an atom probe, uh, which uh, the, uh, corros uh, the surface engineering laboratory uses a lot. Yeah? So it's available for you to use. Of course, there's a cost associated with it, so you must talk to your supervisor first. <laughs> so. Um, those are two things, chemical analysis and the fact that martensite forms at a very low temperature. Is there anything else? Speed of transformation. Yeah. So have you any idea how fast martensite can form? So remember, it's capable of giving out acoustic emissions. So what does that tell you about the speed? 
speed of uh, sound. And roughly, what is the speed of sound inside a uh, steel? Five thousand meters per second. Okay. Now, if you think about a reconstructive transformation, which requires diffusion, the fastest ever reconstructive transformation is in the solidification of pure nickel, which occurs at about eighty meters per second. So, martensite can form much, much faster and a much lower temperature than solidification. At those speeds, it is impossible for diffusion to occur over the time scale of the experiment. Yeah, so these are the three points that we discussed. First of all, it can form at a very low temperature. It does not have to form at a low temperature. It can grow very rapidly at the speed of sound inside the metal. And there is no composition change during transformation. You can use all the clever experimental techniques that we have to prove that there is no diffusion, even on the finest conceivable scale. OK, so uh, we discussed the shape of martensite earlier when we were brainstorming. And there were two shapes suggested. One was a plate, and the other was a needle. What do you think? Are both possible, or is only one correct? Hmm? What, what did you say? Right. No, the shape of the Martin side. What is the shape? How would you determine the shape? Hmm? Uh, by looking, you mean? Yes, the shape will change with composition, but the basic shape, you know, how would you, if I told you to work out the shape of martensite, how would you measure it? Yeah. By, by looking at a section, right? Uh, but does that give you the real shape. You have to look at a series of sections or look at two different surfaces at the same time. So needle is not correct. Needle is like this. And if you, if you section this, very often you will see a round or an elliptical section, but not a plate-like section. Martensite is a plate in three dimensions. So if I show you a micrograph, yeah, you never see sections of a needle. No matter how many micrographs you look at, you will see things which look like a needle in two dimensions. But you never see round sections or small ellipses. In other words, in three dimensions, it's a plate shaped. And later on, I will show you images which are taken on two different surfaces at the same time, where you can see the plate going across the two surfaces. Okay? So in three dimensions, it's like a plate. And a plate is like your book. You know, it, ha it has two dimensions which are approximately equal, and the third dimension which is very thin. Okay? But you can also have a plate in which the two dimensions are slightly different, so it looks like an elongated book. And that's called a lath of martensite. That's what you were saying, that when we change the carbon concentration, the shape of the martensite also changes. Generally, at low carbon concentration, it's like a lath. That means an elongated book. Uh, at high carbon concentrations, it's like a plate, just like the plate we use for eating in three dimensions, except it's flat. Yeah? It's like a plate, yeah. yeah. What, what did you say, approximately? Uh, equal proportion. Uh, 
Yeah, so it's, it's like an oblate spheroid. So it's uh, got two radii which are equal, but one which is very much smaller. Yeah. So we need to explain why martensite forms like a plate. Because perlite doesn't form like a plate, ferrite doesn't form like a plate, so why does martensite form like a plate? So today what I'm doing is I'm summarizing all the characteristics of martensite that we need to explain theoretically. Okay? So there will be some confusion which we will solve later on. So this is uh, what martensite looks like. Uh, if this is my crystal of austenite, and that crystal is surrounded by many other crystals of austenite, in other words, it is constrained. Yeah, so everything around it stops things from changing. Then the martensite will form like a plate. Okay? And this is called the habit plane of martensite. That's the plane on which the martensite forms. It's called the habit plane. However, if I have a single crystal of austenite and I transform it to martensite, the habit plane will still be the same, but this is an unconstrained transformation. That means it just has air around it and it's free to move and you see a shape which is basically like a shear deformation. But it can be very thick because there's nothing to constrain it. So that immediately gives you a clue why we get thin plates because what is the consequence of constraint? Strains. So it's trying to change its shape, yeah? But all the surroundings are stopping it from moving too much. Therefore, the constraint causes it to be a thin plate. I will explain that uh, when we come to deriving an equation for the strain energy. Now, there's something really, really strange about martensite. So if I asked you, what is the slip system in austenite? Can you tell me the slip system? One, one, one plane, which is the closed back plane, and the slip direction? One, one, zero, which is the closed back direction. And similarly, in ferrite, it's one, one, zero, which is almost closed backed, and the one, one, one direction, which is uh, close back direction. So they are very, very simple slip systems, right? Martensite is really strange. It forms on very, very odd planes. So notice the emphasis here that the indices here are approximate. So if I take the square root of 2, it's 1.4141, blah, blah, blah. Yep. Yeah? goes on forever. I can't express it exactly. So we call that an irrational number. These are approximate because the habit plane of martensite is irrational. It's not 1 on 1. It's close to 1 on 1 or close to 295 or 31510. Now why should martensite choose to form on these very strange habit planes? That's one of the questions we need to answer. And we need to be able to predict these habit planes as a function of composition, lattice parameters, and so on. So unlike slip deformation, the deformation of martensite occurs on strange planes. So just like we can define a slip system, we can define the deformation caused by martensite by a plane and the direction of the displacements. Okay. So you can imagine that martensitic deformation is a deformation, just like twinning or slip. Twinning and slip don't change the crystal structure, but with martensite you get a deformation which also changes the structure. And this is the plane on which that deformation happens, and this is the direction in which the deformation happens. So just like a slip system, you have a plane and a direction, a displacement direction. You may even get a volume change. Yeah. 
but the plane indices are strange. And I won't go into this in detail, but you can have an orientation relationship between the austenite and the martensite. That means that certain directions of austenite are aligned to certain directions in uh, martensite. And basically, you can summarize all the observed orientation relationships as follows that the closed pack plane of austenite tends to be parallel to the closed pack plane of ferrite. But not exactly. It's approximately parallel. There's an angle of something like 0.51 of a degree between 111 and 0.011. Why is that? Okay. Similarly, the closed pack direction of the austenite tends to be approximately parallel to the closed pack direction in the ferrite, but not exactly. So even the orientation relationship is irrational. It's not, not the simple things we would expect from slip or twinning. So when people say, you know, they've seen the kojimo sachs orientation, and kojimo sachs orientation, some of you might be familiar with here. Yeah? Are you familiar with that? So that's written as 111 plane of austenite parallel to 011 plane. That cannot be possible, okay? That's just an approximation. They are not actually parallel. Yeah, so these are the commonly quoted orientations, orientation relations between martensite and austenite. And you can see that we write them as 111 exactly parallel to 011. That isn't correct. Okay? These are just approximations. Okay, uh, someone mentioned that martensite forms by rapid cooling. Yeah. Uh, now, that isn't strictly true either. If I add 30 weight percent of nickel to my alloy, then I can cool very slowly down to cryogenic temperature and I will get martensite. So it all depends on the hardenability of your steel. Uh, I can change this time temperature transformation diagram by adding alloying additions. I can cool very, very slowly and get martensite, but in some cases I will need to cool very rapidly to avoid other transformations. Okay. Now, a key characteristic of martensite is that it's athermal. What does that mean? Athermal means if I cool my steel to this temperature, I will get 1% martensite. If I hold it at this temperature, I will still get 1%. There isn't an increase with time. If I cool it further, I will get more transformation. But here, I will get 50% no matter how long I hold it. So here's an equation describing how the volume fraction of martensite changes with the temperature below the martensite start temperature. And you can see there is no time term in there. Okay? So the amount of martensite that you get depends only on the undercooling below the highest temperature at which martensite forms, which is the MS temperature, the martensite start temperature. Okay? Everyone happy with that? So we need to explain why that is the case. If you look at bainite, for example, if I hold at this temperature, I will first get 1%, then 50%, then 95% at a constant temperature. If I look at perlite, again, it's the same. Holding at a temperature increases the amount of transformation. That isn't the case for martensitic transformation. Yeah? So um, it's a very good question that uh, this athermal characteristic, uh, is it uh, always the case or if martensite forms at a high temperature, can you also get you know, isothermal transformation? So this equation here doesn't have any time in it because the time scales involved are so fast that in an experiment we don't observe the fact that 
the transformation is evolving with time up to a certain limit. Okay. So, you know, if it's growing at 5,000 meters per second, then your experiment doesn't detect the evolution of the margin size. So if you alter your alloy chemistry such that you slow the transformation down, then you can get isothermal margin size. Okay. So it depends on your detection limit, time resolution of your experiment. Because margin size plate grows from a tiny object to a big object. Therefore, time is there, but the time scale is very, very short. Okay? So, for most steels, for practical purposes, you can treat it as an athermal transformation. That time is not involved. Okay? There's no diffusion, but there is an interface between the martensite and austenite. So his question is, you know, why, why shouldn't displacive transformation just happen instantaneously because there's no diffusion? So there's an interface between the austenite and martensite, and that interface uh, has features in it that alter the crystal structure when it moves. Yeah? And those features are called dislocations. I, I will go into those later. And dislocations have limits to how fast they can move to accomplish the change in crystal structure. So even though it happens fast, it's not limitless. Yeah. And there's a nucleation stage and a growth stage for mitin sites. So if you could observe fast enough, you would see the plates actually growing. And with shape memory mitin site, uh, you know, it's a slow transformation. It's, it's diffusionless, but slow and you can observe the plates growing and shrinking. And if you go to the uh, online course, there's a movie there showing you the Martin site forming and unforming. And there are at least 100 movies on my website to show you the Martin Cedric transformation. Yeah, slow and fast. Right, right. Uh, it is true that if the transformation happens rapidly, you will also get a temperature spike because of the enthalpy of transformation. That, that would slow it down. Yeah? But it all depends on the balance between the rate of heat evolution, the rate of heat dissipation, and the rate of transformation. Good questions. OK. Um, We've just discussed that there is an interface between martensite and austenite. Uh, how do we create an interface? Well, let's imagine we have a single crystal here. If I cut it, then I get two halves here, and one half is tilted with respect to the other because otherwise it's still a single crystal. If I, if I leave it untilted, then it's still a single crystal. So I tilt it by an angle theta. And you can see that that produces uh, this uh, hole effectively, okay. hole between the two crystals. And we don't see such holes when we look at a grain boundary. Yeah. The grain, uh, ho when we look at the structure, it's completely filling space. So there's something missing here. What I need to do is put material in there. In, uh, so that it fills that triangular hole, right? And that material is dislocations. So an edge dislocation is basically like an extra plane, right? So that's like filling in the hole with extra planes. So here is an array of dislocations and the spacing between the dislocations depends on the Burgers vector of the dislocation and the amount of tilt between this side and this side. Okay. So if I tilt, if I increase the angle theta more, 
then the spacing will decrease because I need to fill that hole even more if theta is large, right? So the structure of an interface can be described in terms of a series of dislocations, the spacing of which depends on the Burgers vector of the dislocation and the angle theta. So if you look in a transmission electron microscope at an interface, you should see dislocations arranged in a beautiful pattern. Okay? Yeah, are you familiar with that? So just look at some images of interfaces in a transmission electron microscope and you'll see that there are a series of dislocations which accommodate the misfit between the two halves of the crystal. So an interface structure is described in terms of dislocations. This is a very simple interface because uh, basically we've cut a single crystal and we've tilted it like this. But you can tilt like this and like this as well. So in general you would need three sets of different dislocations to fill that hole which you create, okay? But the idea is that you can completely describe the structure of an interface using dislocations. Now, here is the same uh, a sort of image, and I've labeled one of these interfaces as glissile and the other one as sessile. Glissile means that it can move without diffusion. So that's like normal slip of a dislocation, where the dislocation can glide if you provide a stress. There's no diffusion needed for the dislocation to glide. And that's because the Burgers vector of this dislocation lies outside of the plane of the interface. Yep. The dislocation can glide if the Burgers vector is not in the plane of the interface, if it's an edge dislocation, right? Here, the dislocation would need to climb in order for the interface to move. So you know what climb is? Yeah, you have, uh, you have an extra half plane here. To move that extra half plane upwards, you need to remove a row of atoms. Or to move it downwards, you need to add a row of atoms. That requires diffusion. So this interface would not be able to move at low temperatures. Now, why am I explaining this to you? Obviously, the interface for martensite must be glissile. Otherwise, it cannot move rapidly, and it cannot move at low temperatures. So we are already saying that the structure of the interface must be such that the dislocations can move rapidly. Okay. It cannot be that the dislocations require diffusion to move. Is everyone happy with that? Okay, so here we have a single set of dislocations. They're all parallel. And I explained to you that in general, you know, you might have three sets of dislocations. Now what happens when you have a dislocation like this and another one like this in the interface? They will try to interfere. So, you know, if this one cuts this, you will get a step on this dislocation, which is equal to the Burgers vector of this one, and vice versa. So what do we call that step on the dislocation? Hmm? Uh, yeah, or, or jog. Jog is the conventional term. Have you heard of a jog? It's a step created on a dislocation when one dislocation cuts through another. Okay, so here's an illustration of jogs. I have here an edge dislocation because the Burgers vector is not parallel to the line vector. And I have here a screw dislocation because the Burgers vector is parallel to the line vector. When they intersect, this one will acquire a step which is parallel to B2, and this one will acquire a step which is parallel to B1. And you can see that here, that this dislocation, uh, sorry, this dislocation 
has a step parallel to B1, okay? Because it's been cut by B1, and this one has a step parallel to B2. So this used to be a screw dislocation, but this part of it is now an edge, right? And the screw dislocation can glide on many planes, but the edge cannot. So what you've done is you reduce the mobility of that dislocation by introducing a jog. So what this says is that the interface for martensite must not have more than one set of dislocations. Because if you have more than one set, they will interfere and make the interface sessile. So it's a very important result that the interface between martensite and austenite must have just one set of dislocations cannot have more than one, otherwise they would interfere with each other and therefore make the interface sessile. It's too early to answer the question, yeah of why the habit plane is irrational. I'm, I'm going to get to that. Yeah? We need to understand uh, a few more difficulties before I can explain. Yeah? OK, so we can only have one set of dislocations. But that also means that that line on which the dislocations lie must be perfectly coherent. Because if it is not perfectly coherent, then you need another set of dislocations. Yeah? So the fundamental principle for martensitic transformation is that you must be able to find one fully coherent line between the parent and product lattices. So if I told you, do you get martensitic transformation in plutonium from a cubic to a monoclinic structure? If you can find one fully coherent line between the two crystals, it would be possible to get martensitic transformation. Okay? If you cannot find a single coherent line, you cannot get a glissile interface. So we call such a line a fully coherent line between the parent and product lattices. We call that an invariant line. invariant line. That means a line which is not distorted and is not rotated. Undistorted and unrotated. And unrotated. Fully coherent. If you cannot find such a line between the parent and product lattices, then it's impossible to get martensitic transformation because you cannot get a glissile interface because you require more than one set of dislocations to accommodate the misfit between the two crystals. Right, so this is a summary of how far we have got. That a glissile interface cannot contain more than one set of dislocations. Right? Otherwise you get jogs, which will stop it from being glissile. And martensitic transformation is only possible if the deformation which changes the parent to the product leaves 
one line undistorted and unrotated. That means an invariant line. So the deformation which changes the parent into the product has to be an invariant line strain. That means it leaves one line completely undistorted and unrotated. Of course, it can be a deformation which leaves more than one line undistorted and unrotated. So if you have two lines like that, then that's an invariant plane. Okay? And that would be an invariant plane strain. But the minimum condition is that the transformation from the parent to product happens by a deformation which is an invariant line strain. If you cannot find such a deformation to change plutonium from FCC to monoclinic, it's not possible to get myelinsidic transformation. Okay. So I think I'll stop there today, and we'll try and solve some of the difficulties in the next lecture. So now you are ready to do the first assignments. Okay? Thank you. Yeah? No, I, th I think it's the relationship between the two. Uh, so, so, for example, in, in copper zinc, you get a transformation from BCC to FCC, martensite, okay? whereas in uh, uh, steel, you get from FCC to BCC. Actually, even in steel, you can get the reverse transformation happening uh, like martensite. So if you, if you take your BCC and you heat it very rapidly, then it will undergo martensitic transformation to austenite. Yeah. First of all, it must be diffusion. So your question is, what is the key characteristic to define martensitic transformation? It must be diffusionless and displacive displacive meaning that there is actually a deformation which carries the parent phase into the product. Yeah? So you will be able to observe the displacements which I haven't shown you yet. Dis mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, in the first slide I showed many different kinds of displacive transformation. So what is the difference between martensite and the others? So you are jumping ahead, okay? So you have to be patient, and I will explain everything, okay? Okay, thank you.